How long was Neil Armstrong actually on the moon? When did Europe start speaking English? Did Marco Polo really go to China? Curiosity Stream is the streaming service for all things history, plus science, wildlife, and more. What's the real story behind the Mona Lisa? We've got that. What caused the collapse of Rome? We know. Where did we find mankind's earliest ancestor? Come find out. For the holidays, get the gift of curiosity with 25% off gift cards for your curious cohorts. It's holiday shopping season at curiositystream.com slash gift. Discover unbeatable deals and convenience at your neighborhood family fair supermarkets. Score exclusive deals, earn rewards, join clubs, and clip digital coupons for extra savings all in one place. Our exclusive offers bring savings straight to your card. Explore a wide range of local products that support your community. With easy pickup and delivery options, saving time and grocery shopping has never been easier. Family Fair is all about making your grocery experience easy and affordable and your one-stop shop for all your grocery needs. Family Fair in your neighborhood. Have your Bibles tonight. Go to Revelation chapter number 13 tonight. Revelation chapter number 13. We finished up Revelation chapter number 12 last week, and we're in Revelation chapter number 13. We dealt with verses. Uh, we started with verses number one. We dealt with Satan's uh, regent princes, and we see we dealt with this uh, last week. Started last week on the false prophet. We dealt with his uh, family likeness. We dealt with his family lineage. And we dealt with, in the book of Daniel, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And then we dealt with he is a real person. And we went over to, uh, we started showing the differences between the lamb and Satan himself, or the beast himself. And tonight I want us to pick up and and not only did we see he was a real person, but tonight I want us to pick up here in Revelation chapter number 13. And I want us to see that he is a representative person tonight. He represents. And what all does he represent tonight? And when we look at Revelation chapter number 13, the beast there is, the, is both an emperor and an empire. The tide in this direction is now in its flood. It first began um, to set in so far as recent times are concerned. Uh, in the prince, in 1513, Machiavelli was infatuated with Caesar Borgia, Duke of Valentino, one of the most unscrupulous rulers of all time, and there's been many that has followed in their footsteps wanting to be have an empire that could rule the world and we know that all of those have failed because we know that God raises up kings and God puts down kings and God in his time will allow the beast to be coming up now when we look at all modern totalitarian governments we see fascist Italy Nazi Germany communist Russia and China has modeled upon these ideas in its complete dictatorship. The head of the state is the state. And when we think about that today, they are very, one thing that you'll learn about all of those places, they're what? Anti-God, right? They, they want to have control of what is said in their country, done in their country, and things like that. Then we get over that God ordained that political ascendancy over the nations be taken away from Israel and given to the Gentiles. We think about that. We can deal with Nebuchadnezzar. Go with me this evening to Daniel chapter number 2. Get your Bibles this evening. Go with me to Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2. And verse number 37, Daniel chapter number 2 and verse number 37, when you find your place there, say amen. Amen. All right. We know that Babylon would be known as the first world empire, correct? So we see here tonight, Daniel chapter number 2, verse 37, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, Strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of, where the children of men dwell, the beast of the field, the fowls of, of the heaven, 
hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. We see that tonight, that God reminded Nebuchadnezzar that without him, he wouldn't have a kingdom. And we must remember that. We look at this tonight, a glance at a map will show that the Babylonian was the smallest of all world empires of scripture. But in principle, world dominion was given to him. Nebuchadnezzar, the first world ruler, did not take uh, did not take the beast the last world ruler will take ultimately his authority will be universal he will take his authority however directly from the devil rather than from God and as we can still consider the parentage of this false prince we have looked at the family likeness and the family lineage but tonight I want us to go a step further and I want us to look at the family legacy here tonight the family legacy when we see this family legacy tonight i want us to go to verse number two verse number two when you find your place in revelation chapter number 13 and verse number two say amen, amen. all right and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon, talking about the devil, gave him, notice this, his power, his seat, and great authority. We must realize that he will have the power to do everything and will have the authority to do everything. Say, all right, how is that important to us? Go with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter number four tonight. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 4 tonight. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 4. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 4. When you find your place there, say amen. amen. All right, verse number 6. And the devil, taking him up into a mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will get, I will I give it. If thou for will worship me, and all shall be the, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan offered Jesus exactly what he's going to offer the beast. Remember when we talk about Christ, Christ was in all likewise tempted just like we would be tempted, right? He tasted death for every man. We know this and as we look at this tonight, we can see that Jesus rejected it. But we know that the beast will gladly accept. Go with me tonight to the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. The book of 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Tonight. And verse number 9. When you find your place in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Let uh, say amen. I'm going to give you all just a minute there. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. When you find your place here, say amen. amen. Actually, go with me, verse number 8. And then shall that wicked, want, that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all powers and signs and lying wonders. We look at this word power tonight. It comes from the word for power. It's dynamis. Uh, power means to do anything. Untrammeled, unhindered power. We must realize that before the resurrection of Christ, Satan 
and his power in the world was, de was designated by the use of his word. But after resurrection, Satan's power was, to, was put under restraint. In the present age, dunamis, untrammeled, unhindered power is given to the believer for witness here. And Satan has no longer the power. We see here that in Luke 19, in Luke 10, verse number 19, it speaks of all the power of the enemy. All Satan has during this present age is a small power, which is subject to another power. But when we get into the tribulation, he is given all power. We know that in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 2, he is called the prince and the power of the air. In Colossians 1.13, believers are delivered from the power of darkness. Paul told Agrippa that his commission was to preach to men and open their eyes and turn them from the power of Satan unto God. So we see here tonight that Satan's power is limited until all of us are taken out in the rapture. Everybody good on that? All right, next I want us to look tonight, not only at the family likeness, I want us to look at the popularity of this prince. What a man he will be in the eyes of the world. The world will go delirious with delight at his manifestation. He will be the answer to all of its needs. He will be filled with all the fullness of Satan. He'll be handsome with a charming Devil may care personality, a genius, superbly at home in all the scientific disciplines, brave as a lion with an air of mystery about him to tease the imagination or to chill the blood as occasion may serve. He'll be a brilliant conversationalist in a score of tongues, in other words, many languages, a soul captivating orator. He will be the idol of all mankind. So the world will not see him as evil, but they will see him as someone that they love and adore. Think about this tonight. The devil does not come with horns and a pitchfork, but the Bible calls him an angel of what? Light, right? When you think about Satan, we think about him as nasty. We think about him as smelling like fire. We think about all these things, but no, he's totally the opposite. Uh, did any of y'all ever watch that TV show called Lucifer that came on USA? So several years ago, there was a TV series called Lucifer. And when you think about it, I, unfortunately, I watched it. And I watched every episode, even after Netflix bought it out, which made it worse. But anyway, I watched every episode, but Lucifer in that show wasn't a terrible person. He had a demon that was in his show. And she was beautiful. He had an angel that was in his show. And it was him. He didn't have horns and a pitchfork, but he was a very... I'm, I'm not gay when I say this, but a very handsome guy. Always dressed and fit to the T. And always had money. And always had everything that he wanted. And people loved him. People answered to him. And then when I think about that, I think about that will be the way that it will be in the last days when the Antichrist is revealed. He'll be popular. What's the reason for his popularity? Let's go to verse number three tonight. Verse number three. The Bible says, And I saw one of his heads as it, was, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast looking upon him as a representative man this is evidently the, a reference to the revival of the Roman Empire as it will be in its final form but the beast is also a real man so when we go over to Revelation chapter number, I don't have time tonight, Revelation chapter number 17, and verse number 9 through 11, the beast is to be slain and brought back to life again. It doesn't take much 
imagination to see what, what that would do to his impact upon the world, his hold upon the minds of men. And more will be said on this when we get to Revelation chapter number 17. When we think about Revelation chapter number 17, we must realize that there is a terrific battle of miracles centering on this entire period of the apocalypse. The two witnesses perform many miracles, smiting the earth again and again and shutting up heaven itself, which we know that Elisha is one of those, right? Elijah, or Elijah. Elijah was there when the heavens were shut up and opened up again, and Elijah will be there again. We've talked about the two witnesses. Some believe it's Moses and Elijah. Others believe that it's Enoch and Elijah. I personally believe it's Enoch and Elijah because, as I said the other night in Bible study when we dealt with this, that neither one of those died. In Hebrews 9.27, it says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this to judgment. So we see here tonight that the two witnesses will be performing many miracles. And we see that these miracles are their protection. They're invincible. We are not told so in so many words. But since the beast is their foe, it will be, it may well be that they themselves strike him with a deadly wound which he dies. Now this is speculation. But be that as it is may, the death stroke of the beast is healed and the beast returns to life. With this master stroke of miracle, the devil brings the world to the feet of his Messiah. From henceforth, the beast is in reality the beast from hell. When we think about that, the point of the Antichrist is to mimic everything that Christ has done. Christ had a crown of thorns planted upon his head. And when we hear about the when we hear about his death, burial, and resurrection, did Thomas say, Lord, let me see where the thorns were? No. He said, Let me see the wound in thy side, right? And the nail prints in the hands. We think about that tonight. The beast will have a wound in his head and it will heal. So in this miracle of his resurrection that is given, the reason is the reason for the popularity of the beast. No doubt the whole thing will be staged by Satan and the false prophet the greatest possible to make the greatest impossible impact upon men. The propaganda machine will see it that the miracle is magnified. And elaborated to the fullest extent, just as the miracle of the resurrection of the two witnesses will be played down in the same way. So what better way to prove that you're invincible and that you're the answer than to die and rise again? Right? Here's the, scary, here's the sad thing about that. Is those that are left had the opportunity to believe on the true Christ that died and rose again. And they failed to believe in him. They think that this is their second opportunity to believe in someone that has died and came back from the dead only to be deceived. So not only do we see the reason of his popularity, but I want us to look at the result of his pop popularity. So preacher, what is it? Um... <clears throat> When we see this tonight, where am I at here? I've lost my place here. All right. Verse number four tonight. I found it. Verse number four. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So think about this here. They're worshiping Satan who gave power to the beast, the Antichrist. And they worshipped the beast. What do we see here? We see idol worship, right? The Bible says, Thou shalt not have no other gods before me, but at this point, God's not here. But God's letting this play out, who is like unto the beast. In other words, who's like him? 
Who can stand against him? Then this is my favorite part. Who is able to make war with him? Well, they forgot about one person. The man that created the world. Who has all of the world and the power in his hand. When we think about this tonight, we see behind all of Satan in this chapter is his single goal to get men to fall down and worship him. When we think about that, this world has witnessed several dress rehearsals for this event in modern times. There were men who worshipped Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, we go modern day to day and Obama, right? Remember those that would go to his speeches and hear him fall down and pass out and faint in his presence and all of this stuff? They worshipped him. As a result of clever use of pageantry and publicity, it is one of the ironies of history that communism, which brings religion, as of the people, has turned the tomb into holies of holies for materialistic faith, and Lenin's body into a sacred lick, into a sacred relic. Tonight, we must realize that the result of the popularity of the beast, there's people who's tried to be like him and wanted to be like him, but it's failed. Why have they failed? Because it's not time for the beast to appear. Does that make sense tonight? In recent times, it was China that Satan staged one of his greatest preparatory displays. There's some billion people in China. And I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. Mayo Tsang transformed them into a dutiful, into a dutiful, obedient puppet. Mayo was a living God. His thoughts became the creed of his people. The little red book of his saying was the Bible of a quarter of the earth's inhabitants. Giant posters of him were never far from view. Terrifying purges and campaigns of intimidation made sure that people towed the line. In China, Mao or Mayo? M-A-O? Yeah, Mao. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Was God. I've never heard of that man before. All right. Oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> He's for us old. <laughs> when we look at Hitler's goose stepping, legion spreading hour after hour, past his reviewing stand, shaking the ground beneath their feet and thundering out their Hill Hitler. When we see the long lines of Russians patiently waiting in Arctic cold for a brief moment of adoration before a coffin of a mummied corpse. And when we see China's millions consulting a dozen times a day the sayings of a wicked old man, then we can see that the world is putting the stage in order for the coming worship of the beast. That's a sad state to be in. So tonight we've looked at the parentage, we've looked at the power, we've looked at the popularity of the beast tonight, but I want us to look at the pur I want us to look at the purposes of this false prince, and we're going to quit here tonight, all right? There's four things that he wants to do. Go with me to verse number five. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and what? Blasphemies. Right? And power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Verse number 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in where, church? Heaven. We see this tonight. Number 1. We see that the purpose of this false prince is to defy the God of heaven. 
Everything in any way related to God is subject to this of this man's blasphemous tongue. He cannot lay a finger on God, nor on the heavenly sanctuary, nor on the glorified saint, but he can and does revile them with his tongue. So as far as the person of God is concerned, so as far as the position of God is concerned, and so far as the people of God are concerned, the beast is impotent. He is reduced to name calling. There have been daring blasphemers on earth before, but none like the beast. Why will he be so blasphemous? Because he's given his power by Satan. Satan does not love God. Satan totally hates God and hates the things of God. When we see this tonight, blasphemies will well up from the dark, satanic depths of this man's abysmal soul. And will flow like sulfurous lava from his lips. God in heaven has noted well what this beast will say and do. And it doesn't take God by surprise. Moving on tonight. Not only will he defy the God of heaven. But his second purpose is to destroy the saints. Verse number 7. And it was given unto him to make war with who? Saints. The saints. And to overcome them. And power was given him to over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That word tongues there is simply the word what? Languages, right? He cannot glorify the saints. He cannot harm the saints in heaven. But he can harm the believers on earth. Who are those believers? That'd be the 144,000, right? So we see that he is going to do his best to harm them. He's going to make war with them. He's going to overcome them. Just as it was given unto Herod to imprison and behead John the Baptist. Just as it was given to Satan to persecute Job. Just as it was given to Pilate to pass sentence of death upon Jesus. It is all a deep mystery now, but it will be eternal weight of glory for the, for the sufferers when God gives out the martyr's crowns. And it was given him to make war with the saints. The, and John says for a brief period of 42 months. He is permitted to use all of his powers against the saints of the Most High God. The great tribulation is unleashed as the beast extends himself to the utmost rid of the earth, of every, ask, of every last believer in God to war. He goes to war. He goes with refurbished equipment. To war he goes with firing squads, gas chambers, long prepared concentration camps, death pits. The experience learned in 60 centuries of torture and terror will be put at the disposal of hell itself or calm for the ideas to expedite the work as Satan desires. That's his purpose. Purpose to defy God. The purpose to destroy the saints. Everybody good? Everybody good? Say amen. amen. All right. Thirdly, tonight, to dominate the nations of the earth. When we see this, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The old Roman world Empire will be his base, but it will not be big enough for him. He must dominate the globe. North, south, east, and west, all people must yield obedience to him. It will not last long, but for a brief season, his power and authority will be acknowledged worldwide. Satan will achieve his goal of unifying the nations Dazzling some, browbeating others, cementing the whole structure together with mortar, mortar of indulgence of every evil passion with the epoxy of horrible 
merciless and unreeling persecution. We see that tonight. We already see those who are running for public office. My goal is to unite the world. That'll never happen until Christ comes back and makes this a new heaven and a new earth. My goal is to unite our country. Our country will never be united. Right? I mean, man, we can barely get a church to unite on something. How are we going to get the whole world to unite on something? But the world tonight is when, when people run for office and we listen to their speeches and they talk about uniting the world and they're talking about giving peace to Israel from Palestine and you're hearing all of these things, all it is is a, another prophecy. Another forerunner of a man that will step forth and say, I have all the answers. I can do everything that all of these are saying, but he won't just say it, but he will do it. So to dominate the nations of the earth. Lastly, tonight in verse number eight, and all that dwelleth upon the earth shall worship him whose names Notice this. Are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So everyone that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Are these that worship him Christians? No. Are these that worship him saved? No. Are they church going people? Probably so. But they're in the tribulation. These people are those that are left behind. Notice this tonight. Me and Miss Joanne was talking before church tonight, and she reminded me of something that I heard a couple weeks or a couple months ago. That after Revelation chapter number three, how many times is the church mentioned in the book of Revelation? Not once. Why? Because we're gone. Right? We're raptured. Now we're in this last part of the, of the, we're getting to the last parts of Revelation. And the writer says, and all them that worship him, they're not of, he, they're not of God. Moving on. Verse number nine, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. When we look at this tonight, there is poetic justice in all of this. Those who act as the beast agents in executing his will upon those people of God in turn must be given over by God to the same fate. Let me think about that. The majority will take out the insurance of compliance with the beast and will worship him. And all those without a living faith will bow knee in adoration. Go with me tonight to 2 Thessalonians 2.4. 2 Thessalonians 2.4, when you find your place there, say amen. I left my Bible there because I knew we was coming back. All right, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And verse number four, when you find your place there, say amen. amen. All right. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Satan is not against religion. As a matter of fact, Satan is for religion because religion doesn't save people, but religion does what tonight, church? It damns people, right? You can go to church all your life and have religion and never accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And what is the outcome of religion? It sent you to hell, right? Tonight, we've got people that are bound by the cords of religion. You ask them, are you a Christian? I think so. I hope so. Maybe so. My mom and daddy went to church. My grandpa and my grandma went to church. If they're saved, then I'm saved. No. That's religion. 
Moving on tonight. The beast will be the incarnation of all the world's religious hopes. He will be the Christ of the cults. The reincarnate Buddha of Buddhism. He'll be the reincarnate of Madha of Islam. The semen Messiah of Israel. The kind of Messiah the Jews have always wanted. Men will unite in worshiping Him. For the last time, the cry goes forth. Groups of God's people are no longer in focus. It has come down to, in, to individuals now. One here and one there will stand out against the rising, rising flood tide of popular enthusiasm and religious fervor of the beast. Captivity, execution, and torture await. The faithful, patience, and faith will be needed. There will be those who will respond. Who are those? The Jews, right? 144,000. Notice that 144,000 people sounds like a lot of people. Does it not? But when you look at all the people that is left behind, how do you think the 144,000 is going to shake out? Not very many. That's why we say there'll be here, there'll be a few here and a few there that will stand out, that will be persecuted and receive the martyr's crowns. Next week, we'll, we finish with the false prince tonight. Next week, I want us to pick up with the false prophet in verse number 11 through 18. Any questions, any comments, any concerns on everything that's been taught tonight? Yes? Uh, 144,000. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.